Hi, this is Professor Moore, and this is the second video re reviewing the Erie Doctrine. The first video I posted uh, earlier today. And the second video here is dealing with the more difficult part of the doctrine, which Professor Joseph Glannon has called Erie Erie, dealing with that part of the doctrine that involves the Rules Enabling Act. I want to start with the same caveats that I made in the last video and importantly I am only covering the cases and the material that I assigned my class this semester spring 2014. The principal cases that we covered were Erie itself, Claxon, Hannah B. Plumer, and Shady Grove. So if you are in another section that or another class that covered more than this uh, I may try to indicate where the material that uh, you probably covered would go, but I'm not going to really go into it. And also, of course, what I'm trying to do is give a broad overview of this doctrine so that you kind of have the big picture and that will necessarily require me to do some pretty major simplification of some of the niceties of the doctrine. So. I will again go through uh, the importance of being able to recognize an Erie issue um, on the exam. Back in the days when I used to give sort of large issue spotting civil procedure exams, which I no longer do, um, it, it would become apparent to me that a very large percentage of the class would entirely fail to see the Erie issue in the fact pattern. And so I've taken to explaining to students, here's how you spot this issue. So what you're going to have is a case that is obviously in federal district court, and it's probably going to uh, be in federal district court because of diversity jurisdiction, or the federal district court might be considering a supplemental claim or a, a state law claim that is brought under the supplemental jurisdiction of the federal courts. Um, so the Erie Doctrine, in other words, applies not only to cases in diversity but also to claims under state law that are brought within the supplemental jurisdiction of the federal district court. So you're there in federal district court and one party is claiming that there's some weird little state law that the federal court should apply and the other party is probably claiming that the federal court should apply uh, this other federal law or at the very least the other party is saying no we shouldn't be applying the state law. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about how you are probably going to be expected on my exam to identify the federal law yourself. Uh, but again, I have to emphasize that this may sound extremely simplistic, but you uh, definitely need to be clear in your own mind about what is the state law that someone is saying should be applied by the federal court and what is the competing federal rule that the other person wants the federal the uh, district court to apply. So here is an example from an old exam question of mine which I have posted on TWIN that I can use to illustrate what I mean when I say that you are probably going to be expected on my exam to be able to figure out what federal rule of civil procedure or rules might be implicated by the particular factual situation in front of you. Uh, and this is a way that I can test material that not only we covered this semester but um, also material that we covered from last semester which St. Thomas policy requires that I to some degree um, test on what we covered last semester as well as this in a year-long course. So uh, in my old exam question I um, fictionalized a state called Pennsylvania misspelled and fictionalized 
a statute that this, this state's legislature has passed as part of a tort reform package. And you can read this exact fictional, fictional statute on the screen. But in essence, what this fictional state statute is saying is that a plaintiff is not going to be allowed to put a claim for punitive damages into an original complaint, that the plaintiff is going to have to convince the court that there is um, a reasonable basis for recovery of punitive damages. And then if the plaintiff convinces the court of that, then the plaintiff can be allowed to amend the complaint to add a claim for punitive damages. And it further goes on to talk about how um, the plaintiff is going to be able to do discovery uh, on trying to determine whether there's evidence that will establish punitive damages. So that's your hypothetical state court, or, or excuse me, state statute. And hopefully, um, just hearing this and seeing this, you uh, will be able to come up with several federal rules of civil procedure that, you know, seem to cover the same waterfront here. For example, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 8 deals with uh, general pleading standards. In essence, uh, what does a person who claims relief and who files a complaint in federal district court, what do they have to put into that complaint? Uh, and within Rule 8, there is certainly nothing about any special requirement for pleading punitive damages. In fact, it says, uh, part of Rule 8 says that you um, need to make a prayer for relief, which would, of course, include a prayer for damages, but it doesn't further say anything special about pleading punitive damages. Um, indeed, there is a, a, a separate rule, Rule 9, that talks about pleading special damages in particular instances, and it says nothing about punitive damages. And then, of course, uh, Rule 15 of the Federal Rules of Civil, Civil Procedure deal with amending pleadings. And finally, um, Rule 26 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure talk about the scope of discovery and, and what kinds of issues um, are discoverable. So there's a plethora of Federal Rules of Civil Procedure that are sort of implicated by this particular statute. And so you would need to be able to know that. So I'm not going to tell you, oh, by the way, you know, uh, the, the plaintiff is saying rules 7, 8, 9, and, and whatever are the ones that should be applied. You have to figure that out for yourself. All right, so getting back to our overview of the Erie Erie Doctrine, here's a uh, multiple choice question for you. What happened in 1938? A, the Supreme Court decided Erie Railroad v. Tompkins. B, Hitler invaded Poland. C, the federal rules of civil procedure went into effect. D, both A and C, and E, A, B, and C. Uh, and the correct answer is D, Hitler invaded Poland in 1939. So anyway, what's my point here? The point is that um, these two watershed events in federal civil procedure, the decision in Erie and uh, the adoption of the federal rules, um, both occurred during the same year, which was 1938. And together, they contribute to this general working rule that we have that a federal district court sitting in diversity or hearing a state law claim under supplemental jurisdiction will apply the substantive law of the state in which it sits which includes the state's choice of law rules, and federal procedural law. So that simple sentence uh, really um, addresses a lot of issues, which can be easily answered by the application of that simple general rule. However, uh, the problem is that um, there are many rules many laws which have both a procedural aspect to them and a substantive aspect to them. 
So at some point the labels substantive and procedural are not useful and become just labels and they break down. And so a lot of the Supreme Court's case law in this area is um, goes to great lengths to avoid using the labels substantive and procedural. So for example, um, going back to this old exam question that I was just talking about, um, you can see that this hypothetical state statute here uh, is both procedural and it sort of seems substantive as well. So it's procedural of course in the sense that it's talking about what can you actually put in your complaint and you know when can you move to amend your complaint and what about discovery. Um, so those are all uh, very highly procedural things but it also seems substantive because it seems what that what the legislature is really saying and particularly since it was passed as part of a so-called tort reform package um, what they're really saying is we just don't like punitive damages and we're going to be putting more restraints on the ability to obtain punitive damages or even to plead punitive damages and that starts to sound like a substantive purpose because after all, how much money you can actually get for violation of some particular law, what could be more substantive than that? How much money you can get? Uh, so this is the problem with trying to label something substantive or procedural is that a lot of things are both. So between the Erie case, which was um, of course the watershed case and Hannah versus Plumer which was decided in 1965 um, obviously there was uh, a lot of development in this area but I didn't assign in any of it <laughs> except for the Claxon case um, I skipped straight to Hannah uh, but let me say a few words uh, and I lectured a little bit about this in class as well um, let me say a few words about what happened in between on this doctrine so that uh, it provides a little bit of background for Hannah. One of the important cases which I did not assign uh, was a case called Guarantee Trust Company versus York and if you ever want a read a, to read a case where you would desperately wish that the Supreme Court Justice who authored the opinion would have Iraqed read this case. But in any event, um, what we saw here was uh, one party, the defendant obviously, who argued that uh, there was this New York State statute of limitations that should be applied and that the case that was filed by the plaintiff was um, way out of time under the statute of limitations. The plaintiff argued that the federal district court should apply the federal equitable doctrine of latches which is uh, more of a fluid doctrine that doesn't have a precise limit on the amount of time you have until um, your cause of action exp expires. And so what Justice Frankfurter in the York case um, ended up doing was uh, formulating something that is now called the outcome determinative test, although it he didn't call it that at the time, but the the uh, the operative quote here is: Does it significantly affect the result of a litigation for a federal court to disregard a law of a state that would be controlling in an action upon the same claim by the same parties in a state court? So, in other words, if the federal court doesn't apply this state law is the outcome of the litigation going to be different in federal court uh, than it would be in state court? And if so, then the federal court should apply state law. Um, another important case which I did not assign is Byrd versus Blue Ridge and this involved a clash or uh, two uh, competing rules, one, one of which was the state rule, was that a judge 
was going to determine the factual question of whether the plaintiff was an employee of the defendant, thus relegating plaintiff to a workers' compensation scheme rather than uh, tort law. Um, and the federal practice of allowing juries to decide factual disputes rather than having judges decide factual disputes. And so um, the court there considered, it, it did apply York, um, but, but the court there believed that it wasn't necessarily outcome determinative if a federal district court decided this issue of whether the plaintiff was an employee of the defendant because the jury might decide the same thing as the judge so it wasn't necessarily going to come out differently uh, in federal court or in state court um, but that and so therefore the court went on to, to talk about well what are the federal interests in this rule we you know we we do look at the state court or the state rule but what about the federal interests in, in our rule? And this was considered to be an interest of supreme importance because it involved our um, enshrinement of uh, a jury trial right and to have a jury um, decide disputed fact questions. So there were many other Supreme Court cases decided between Erie and Hannah. None of them held that a federal rule of civil procedure directly applied to the situation in front of the court. And most of these cases, if not all of these cases, ended up with the federal district court sitting in diversity applying the state law to the point where people actually wondered if Erie was sort of the death of the federal rules of civil procedure. And then came Hannah v. Plumer in 1965 and set down the basic structure of the analysis that we continue to engage in today when we have a problem like this. So the basic facts of Hannah uh, was a simple negligence case um, in a, a car accident. The plaintiff filed this action in federal district court in Massachusetts uh, based on the diversity jurisdiction. And the defendant was the executor of the uh, alleged tort feasor's estate. So the person who was alleged to have caused the car accident had subsequently died. And so the defendant was actually the executor of that person's estate. And Massachusetts state law required that when you were suing an executor, you needed to serve process personally on the executor. So in hand service of process was required. As you uh, know though, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 4E2 um, allows substituted service on a defendant. In other words, you can leave, your process server can leave the complaint and the summons um, at the defendant's usual uh, dwelling place, dwelling place or usual place of abode with a person of suitable age and discretion who resides therein. So that rule allowing substituted service on a defendant in the federal court uh, was numbered 4D1 at the time of Hannah and that's how it's referred to in the opinion but it's essentially um, the same rule that exists today, um, the federal rule of civil procedure 4E. So uh, the defendant in Hannah was served by substituted service, not by in-hand service. And uh, that occurred um, before, sorry, um, the service by substituted service occurred before the statute of limitations ran on the claim, um, but by the time uh, anyone had complained that the executor did not receive in-hand service, the statute of limitations on the claim had run. So there wasn't time to go back and just redo it by serving um, the executor personally. So obviously, um, applying state law, the district court would have dismissed this case because it would have been um, filed out of time under this state law uh, requiring in-hand service on the executor. 
So the court in Hannah recognized that this was the first case that had come before the Supreme Court since the decision in Erie Railroad versus Tompkins where there was actually a federal rule of civil procedure that directly covered the situation in front of it uh, and that you simply could not apply both this state rule requiring in-hand service and the federal rule of civil procedure allowing substituted service they they just couldn't be applied harmoniously uh, you either allow substituted service or you do not so it recognized that it was it was dealing with the first situation uh, that was actually covered by the federal rules of civil procedure and so it said when a situation is covered by the federal rules of civil procedure um, the question facing the court is a far cry from the typical relatively unguided eerie choice the court has been instructed to apply the federal rule and can refuse to do so only if the advisory committee this court and congress erred in their prima facie judgment that the rule in question transgress transgresses neither the terms of the Rules Enabling Act nor constitutional restrictions. So, um, what we get from the HANA analysis is essentially an initial question that depending on how you answer the initial question dictates which of two paths you're going to take in the analysis and the all-important initial question to ask which I've put at the top of this flowchart is is there a federal rule of civil procedure that covers the point in dispute. Now, I'm going to stop here just for a second and say that you can modify my flowchart here to talk about federal statutes that are passed directly by Congress uh, dealing with procedural issues as well as federal rules of civil procedure. In my class, we did not read any cases that dealt directly with federal statutes rather than federal rules of civil procedure and therefore um, I have limited my chart to refer to federal rules of civil procedure so for those of you that have covered more than that or you see more than that in a study aid that you're reviewing um, that's fine uh, I've just limited the flowchart here to the federal rules of civil procedure all right, so this all-important first question here. So how do we tell uh, whether there's a federal rule of civil procedure that covers the point in dispute? There are various ways that the, court, the Supreme Court has characterized the question that you're asking here. Um, one of the quotes in Hannah versus Plumer says, you know, in our earlier cases, the scope of the federal rule was not as broad as the losing party urged and therefore there being no federal rule which covered the point in dispute state law applied uh, the court also referred to how the clash between the federal rule of civil procedure and the competing state law had to be unavoidable there had to be a direct collision and as I alluded to earlier, the court concluded that um, in this situation, there is a direct collision because either you allow substituted service, as does the federal rule of civil procedure, or you do not allow substituted service, which this particular Massachusetts statute did not on an executor. So the, the court was squarely presented with a question which it had never been presented with before. To give you another example of a case uh, where you would be applying that first initial question that would dictate um, 
which path of analysis you would proceed along. Um, let me talk briefly about a case called Walker versus Armco Steel, which I did not assign, but it's easy enough to just tell you the basics of it. Um, the plaintiff there in a diversity case filed the complaint in federal district court before the statute of limitations ran, so before the expiration of the year or the two years or whatever it was, but um, unfortunately for the plaintiff did not actually serve the defendant with process um, until after the statute of limitations had run. So there was an Oklahoma statute uh, which said in essence that the statute of limitations is not told or it's not stopped running until service of process is actually served on the defendant. Uh, the plaintiff, however, argued that the court should follow Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 3, which says a civil action is commenced by filing a complaint with the court. So the plaintiff said, you know, here's how you stop the statute of limitations in federal court under Rule 3. You simply file a complaint. So using the question at the top of the flow chart, um, is there a federal rule of civil procedure that covers the point in dispute? You would ask, does Rule 3 uh, address the issue of whether the statute of limitations is told by filing the complaint? And the Supreme Court answered this question, no, it didn't, that Rule 3 just didn't address the issue of statute of limitations. Uh, it was a just a procedural um, rule telling you how to start a, a case in federal district court. It didn't purport to say anything about the statute of limitations effect. Um, and conversely, that the Oklahoma statute um, was based in the policy behind statutes of limitations which are to give the defendant a sense of repose and to make sure that this, the uh, suit isn't stale so that all the evidence has disappeared um, and that actual notice to the defendant by serving, stat, uh, by serving process on the defendant under, underlay um, those policy reasons. So the court um, held that the case was untimely because Rule 3 didn't cover the situation. So first I'm going to cover um, the side of the flowchart that deals with the holding in HANA since HANA held that Rule 4 covered the point at issue there and directly conflicted with the Massachusetts state statute. It uh, could not avoid um, going down a different path than had been followed by earlier cases. So the first question after that, that when we say there is a federal rule of civil procedure that covers the point in dispute and we say yes, the first question after that is, does Congress have the constitutional authority uh, to have passed this federal rule of civil procedure on its own. And so a couple things need to be said about that. Um, first, what Hannah said in general was for the constitutional provision for a federal court system augmented by the Necessary and Proper Clause, carries with it congressional power to make rules governing the practice and pleading in those courts, which in turn includes a power to regulate matters which, though falling within the uncertain area between substance and procedure, are rationally capable of classification as either. So to give you a little bit of background because um, my students have not had constitutional law yet. Um, the United States Constitution 
uh, sets forth a federal government of limited powers. And so the idea is if um, the power to legislate on something by the United States Congress is not set forth in Article One of the United States Constitution, then then uh, the federal Congress doesn't have the power to legislate about that, and that power would be reserved to the states. So, um, one of the many things that Congress is given the power to legislate about in Article One is to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Um, this is also stated, of course, in Article Three. Uh, so Congress has the power to create federal courts that are lower than the Supreme Court. And of course, Congress has done so. And so then there's this catch-all provision in the Constitution where Congress also has the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. So uh, what the court in Hannah was saying is that, you know, if Congress has the power to create a lower federal court system, then it needs, it's necessary and it's proper for Congress to go ahead and create rules of procedure uh, that are going to govern those courts, because you can't just sort of create the courts and then say, you know, do whatever. So um, the first layer of authorization for this federal rule of civil procedure that we need to ask about is, could Congress itself have legislated and passed this federal rule of civil procedure? So the question um, kind of boils down to, you know, is this federal rule of civil procedure rationally capable of being characterized as a procedural rule. And so, you know, the answer to that is probably always <laughs> going to be yes, considering that it's a rule that's within the federal rules of civil procedure. Um, but conceptually, that's the question that you ask. So that's one level of authority that this federal rule of civil procedure has to pass through before the federal district court knows for certain that it can go ahead and apply this federal rule to the dispute in front of it. The second level of authorization that this rule has to pass through is authorization under the Rules Enabling Act. So let me back up and explain a little bit about the Rules Enabling Act. So this is the other statute that is implicated uh, by the Erie Doctrine. Uh, the first that we saw in the last video was 1652, the uh, Rules of Decision Act. The Rules Enabling Act, uh, also in Title 28 of the United States Code, is Section 2072. And it's sometimes called the Rules Enabling Act, it's some kind, sometimes called just the Enabling Act, and it's sometimes called the REA. All mean the same thing. And this has two subsections that are relevant here. The first subsection, subsection A, says the Supreme Court shall have the power to prescribe general rules of practice and procedure and rules of evidence for cases in the United States District Courts and Courts of Appeals, of course. Um, so that's just saying uh, we, Congress, passed this statute, this federal statute, 2072, and we are delegating our power to write rules of procedure for the federal courts to the Supreme Court to go ahead and write such rules. The second subsection of 2072, 2072B, then puts the proviso on this that such rules, these new rules that the Supreme Court is going to promulgate, shall not abridge, enlarge, or modify any substantive right. So then you kind of, you know, slam your hand against your head and say, now we've just introduced the word substantive back into the analysis when we were trying so hard not to use that word anymore. But we'll get um, to uh, the state of 
the Supreme Court law on 2072B toward the end of this video. For now, let's just focus on 2072A um, and the practice by which a federal rule of civil procedure becomes law. So this is charted out in your case book on page 929 and all of this by the way is um, is set forth explicitly in the statutes um, the sections following 2072 if you wanted to look it up but it's it's quite an extensive uh, process where although 2072A says it's the Supreme Court that has the delegation of authority to promulgate these federal rules of civil procedure. Um, it's not actually the Supreme Court justices that are doing that. They in turn have delegated um, their authority to a group of committees that make policy and make decisions for the federal courts. So where a federal rule of civil procedure or an amendment thereto um, usually starts is with the advisory committee on civil rules which proposes you know some kind of amendment or some kind of new rule and I think I mentioned in class that they currently have proposed many amendments to the federal rules of civil procedure um, almost none of which I like but uh, they don't really care what I think. <laughs> so anyway, um, they publish those uh, proposed amendments for comments and people uh, make comments and their public hearings are held and then the advisory committee holds another meeting and decides uh, whether to approve these these rules or uh, how to how to change them based on the comments. Um, and then once the advisory committee has approved them, uh, the rules go to what's called the standing committee, which is called the Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure. Um, it, all of these committees are primarily made up of federal judges, uh, although they have a, a couple of other people on who might be law professors or practicing attorneys, but primarily these committees are made up of federal judges. Um, after the standing committee approves the rule, it then goes to um, an even higher body called the Judicial Conference of the United States, which is the principal policy making body for the federal courts. Uh, if the Judicial Conference approves the rule, it is then passed along to the Supreme Court for its approval. If the Supreme Court approves the rule, the rule then goes to Congress. And um, Congress can vote that the rule should not go into effect but if Congress does nothing then the rule will automatically go into effect. So that's the rather long and um, complicated process for the approval of a federal rule. So the point of this in the context of the HANA analysis is that um, Congress itself did not directly pass the federal rules of civil procedure. And so there's a different level of uh, sort of authorization that we have to go through to make sure that a federal rule of civil procedure was properly uh, promulgated under our constitutional system. So um, the question is, did Congress give the Supreme Court the authority to pass this particular federal rule of civil procedure in the Rules Enabling Act. So given that 2072 says the Supreme Court has the power to prescribe general rules of practice and procedure for the district courts, um, it's going to be a really hard sell to say that this particular federal rule of civil procedure that you're talking about uh, for example, in Hannah, it was Rule 4, is uh, not a rule of practice and procedure. Um, but non nonetheless, this is the inquiry that Hannah is having us make. So Hannah gives us uh, a further test for how to answer this question, uh, citing the case of Sibach versus Wilson, and says the test must be must be whether a rule really regulates procedure. 
the judicial process for enforcing rights and duties recognized by substantive law and for justly administering remedy and redress for disregard or infraction of them. So does the rule in question really regulate procedure? So this question is, you know, let's face it, a little bit silly. We're talking about the federal rules of civil procedure and of course within that any given rule is probably going to be a rule that regulates procedure. So um, it's not a test that has a whole lot of bite. So when you go back to this chart, um, the first question that you're going to ask under the Hannah Holding branch is would Congress have had the constitutional authority to pass this particular federal rule by itself? And the question there is, um, is this rule rationally capable of being classified as procedural? And then if you say yes, um, you ask, well, uh, did Congress give Supreme, the Supreme Court the authority to pass this particular federal rule in the Rules Enabling Act? And, and you ask, uh, does this particular rule really regulate procedure. Um, you can see that once you get to the Hannah holding part of the analysis, you're pretty much going to conclude that the federal district court is going to apply the federal rule of civil procedure. Um, the only possible break on uh, the almost inexorable path to a yes in the Hannah Holding um, analysis is 2072B, which was not directly and specifically addressed in Hannah B. Plumer, uh, and so I'm not going to address it right now, but I'm going to pick it up in a few minutes when I talk about Shady Grove. All right, so you can see then that because it is so easy to decide that you are going to apply the particular federal rule of civil procedure once you decide that it does in fact cover the point in dispute, the, the question at the top of the chart is really important uh, and because whichever side you start to go down, um, you're pretty much the answer is almost preordained. So if you, if you go down the left side of the chart, you're going to be applying the federal rule of civil procedure. If you go down the right side of the chart, uh, you're usually going to be applying the state rule. So left side of the chart was the HANA holding. The right side of the chart um, represents the HANA dictum. So the court in HANA went through an analysis that it would have applied, or it, it did kind of apply the analysis, but, but I'm, we're calling it dictum because the court didn't have to engage in this discussion. Because remember, it answered that very top question, yes, uh, rule four definitely covers the point in dispute. So it didn't need to go on and say, well, but if we'd answered that question no, then we would have done blah, blah, blah. But it did that anyway, probably to spell out um, uh, thinking for the lower courts as they proceeded forward. So if you do come to the conclusion, as for example, the Supreme Court did in Walker versus Steele, uh, Walker versus Armco Steele, that uh, a federal rule of civil procedure does not, in fact, cover the point in dispute. Now you're into the Hannah dictum part of the analysis, um, or in other words, the York case as modified by Hannah. Um, and what Hannah, Hannah applied York uh, all the way back to the outcome determinative test, um, but it phrased the question a little bit differently. It made some tweaks to that test, which made the test a little bit more useful. So it said, let's think about um, the purposes of Erie. Um, one of the purposes of Erie was to um, discourage forum shopping. And another was to avoid inequitable administration of the laws. 
So these are somewhat two sides of the same coin, but remember what we're referring to is um, we don't want somebody who has the benefit of diversity jurisdiction existing in their particular case to have a better outcome than somebody who's in exactly the same situation but simply you know because of the accident of people's citizenship um, don't have the opportunity to go into federal court under diversity jurisdiction and are simply stuck in state court and so if in other words if you're from out of state and you're sued by a party in state then um, and so you're able to invoke uh, the diversity jurisdiction of the federal courts and thereby get a better rule in federal court it seems like that person is uh, or, or it seems like the operation of that system would would discriminate against in-staters who can't avail themselves of diversity jurisdiction and so what the important question to ask, said Hannah, in deciding this outcome determinative test is look at the decision of a forum that the person making the choice between state court and federal court would make at the time they're making it and ask, you know, if I go to federal court with this case and the federal court does not apply this particular state law. Do I like that? So would I choose federal court instead of state court knowing that federal court's not going to apply the state law and the state court is going to apply the state law? Um, if so, then it's very likely that this particular state court rule or law is outcome determinative because you know it's important enough that you are choosing federal court to avoid it uh, and so notice as an aside here um, this is sometimes confusing to students that it can be either the plaintiff or the defendant who we're talking about in making this choice so obviously if you have the basis for diversity jurisdiction um, then the plaintiff in initially filing the complaint can choose between state court or federal court if the plaintiff chooses state court then so long as the defendant is an out-of-state citizen the defendant can second guess the plaintiff's choice and remove the case to federal court so um, the defendant has the opportunity to make this eerie forum shopping decision as well it just depends on who the person is making the decision but regardless of which party is going to be put in this position of making the decision between state court and federal court um, the time that you would make this decision is the time that we in thinking about the differences between the state rule and federal rule um, should be applying as well so in other words as we uh, used to say at the University of Chicago um, we look at this choice in an ex-ante way um, not an ex post way and I see here that I probably misspelled ex post but sorry about that um, okay so in other words take Hannah itself um, at the time that the case was decided even by the district court let alone the Supreme Court obviously if we apply the state law we're going to get a different outcome than if we apply the federal law because the state law required this particular type of service which had not been done and now it was too late because the statute of limitations had run um, so if we look at this forum choice today 
Of course, the difference between service of process in state court and federal court is outcome determinative. But the court said that doesn't make any sense. The time in which we should, the time at which we should look at that decision is when they would actually be making that decision. So you put yourself back to when the plaintiff originally filed the lawsuit and you say, okay, I'm the plaintiff, I can choose uh, federal court because we have diversity jurisdiction here. Um, federal court allows me to do substituted service on the defendant, but if I sue in Massachusetts state court, I'm going to have to um, serve the defendant in hand or uh, with personal service. And you ask, you know, would that difference really cause the plaintiff to have chosen federal court um, instead of state court? And the answer is probably not. You know, if you, if you know in advance um, that you've got to serve the executor in hand, you'll probably just do it. And if, if all other things are equal and you prefer the Massachusetts state court, um, you probably wouldn't choose federal court just because you have this uh, ability to have substituted service. So um, we're moving forward, the, or moving back in time, um, the decision of, when, uh, of whether this difference in uh, state law and federal law would contribute to forum shopping. And then the court also said, we're not going to worry about trivial variations between federal and state law. And it uh, considered this particular variation in uh, service of process uh, to obviously be somewhat trivial. So um, if you uh, get to the end of that discussion on whether the state rule is outcome determinative in that sense, in the sense that a party would actually choose federal court over state court if the federal court were to apply uh, the federal rule and not apply the state rule, um, so if you say, yes, a party would choose federal court if it didn't have to be bound by the state rule, then, oddly, uh, your answer is, well, then that probably means the federal court should be applying that state rule so that we get the same outcome in federal court as we do in state court. And if your answer is, no, you know, a party wouldn't really consider the state rule to be that important and wouldn't choose federal court just because of just because they wanted to avoid the state rule, um, then you can probably go ahead and apply the federal rule. Okay, well I see that um, this video is already 52 minutes long, and so I think what I'm going to do is end this one here and do one final video on Shady Grove where we will be able to go through this entire analysis as applied to the facts in Shady Grove Orthopedic. So I hope this has been helpful and have a great day or a great evening.